Hello, good evening. I think some people are still trying to find seats, but okay. Hi. Uh, so thank you for coming out on this beautiful evening. Um, <laughs> we appreciate it. My name is Heather Clifford. I'm the president of the Kingswood Oxford Parent Association. The Parent Association is honored to host Rabbi Philip Lazowski, one of the few remaining survivors of the Holocaust. Uh, Rabbi Lazowski was just 11 years old when the Nazis invaded his hometown of Bielitsa, now known as Belarus. Tonight, he will share with us the events that unfolded after that invasion and how he maintains his faith and belief in humanity. Earlier this year, KO history teacher Stacy Savin invited Rabbi Lazowski to speak at her class on human rights. The students had such an overwhelming response to this visit that we realized we needed to invite the rabbi to come to speak to the community at large. I would like to give special thanks to Renee Ottorino and Jody Sprague, the Parent Association Education Coordinators, and Lisa Schwartz, a KO parent and member of the Lazowski family, for organizing this incredible event. Rabbi Lazowski's book, Faith and Destiny, will be available to purchase in the lobby after the presentation. And now it is the Parent Association's great honor to introduce Rabbi Philip Lazowski. Thank you all for coming in the rain. As you know, when it rains, it's lucky. So you are lucky that I'm here. <laughs> and I'm lucky to see you. <clears throat> so thank you so very much for inviting me to speak about genocide. I'm here not as a rabbi, but as a Holocaust survivor. As you look at me and hear me, you will be able to tell your children and your grandchildren that you once met a Holocaust survivor and heard his story. There are very few Holocaust survivors still alive. In about five or six years, hence, there will hardly be any survivors. So now, as in Iran and in Syria and other countries, they are claiming that the Holocaust is a myth that never existed. I am a living proof as a Holocaust survivor. So it compels me to bring this story so humanity will understand what genocide does, what the Holocaust means, and what anti-Semitism stands for. Genocide is a systematic annihilation of racial and cultural group, or even a nation or a country. So we are here to learn history especially about the Holocaust. It is said, those who forget history are doomed uh, to uh, repeat it. And those who are ignorant of their history, some people will write their history, but it wouldn't be your history. It would be their history. So there are many good reasons to study history, to gain a better understanding of the past, and to understand the past, we can understand better the present. History educates, and history points to ask questions. And when we ask questions, we learn. It is important to ask questions. The tragedy of the Holocaust is almost 
too great to grasp. The darkest chapter in the history of humankind. When words are used, they mean something. But when they stripped of their preciseness, they lose their ability to communicate clearly. Words should not be entrapped by the perversion of truth. Clever distortions of words can lead to hate. Now, hate is very destructive. There is nothing worse than hate. When people hate, it's the worst thing in the world. And that's what we're facing today. A lot of hate that's going on in this modern world that we live in. As you know, in the book of Leviticus, chapter 19, verse 16, it stands, or it states, do not stand idle by when the blood of your neighbor is being spilled. The world turned its back on its responsibilities. For your pain jury, there was no escape. All the doors were closed to them. The Red Sea did not open as it did in Egypt. The Mediterranean was closed by the British as the Jews wanted to emigrate to Palestine, to Israel. The Atlantic Ocean did not open when vessels arrived with refugees. It's what turned back to Europe by the United States officials. Where were the guardians of the world morality? The world did not care. And their unpardonable, pardonable silence made them accessories, allowing the Holocaust to happen, to have unleashed the beast of humankind. The Nazis abrogated to themselves the power of life and death, taking themselves the right to slaughter young and old. The only freedom was death. So, I would like to tell you my story. This is just an introduction to my story. I am the firstborn of five children. When I was 11 years old, the war started. That was in 1941. When the Nazis occupied my little town that I was born, Belitsa, I was 11 years old. As soon as they entered the, the town, they burned our home. And four children and I and my family went out from the house holding hands with the little kids. Since I was 11, the youngest was six and a half. So, we saw a scene that the Nazis started to shoot anybody in their way, even cattle, horses, etc. And they burned three quarters of the town. During the night, we spent in the pasture. And in the morning, thank God, we were able to come to my grandfather's home that was not burned. Only three weeks passed by, 
and the Nazis started their a job to do on people. Namely, they took first the intelligent people from the town, all the principals, the teachers, the doctors, and they demanded money for their lives. The people gave everything that they possessed. They said, it's not enough, and they killed them all to make sure that there would be sheep without a shepherd. That means all the leaders, they tried to, dis to destroy. That shouldn't be no leadership at all. In a few weeks later, they took from our town all the people and moved them to another town in a ghetto. In the ghetto, seven of us were placed in one room. No furniture on the floor. Now, the background for my family is that my father was a fisherman. What does it mean, a fisherman? In Europe, you rent about 15 kilometers of the river. We lived on the river next to the river Niemann, which falls in the Baltic Sea, quite a big river. And people used to make a living for fishing. So my father had many good friends that fished together. And when we were in the ghetto, the Christian friends came to us and told us that in the other ghettos they are being massacred. What are you going to do about it? We had no place where to go, so we digged a cave in the ghetto. When the massacre started, since I was the firstborn son, I was the one who offered to close the cave so she wouldn't be recognized, she shouldn't be noticed. As soon as I covered the cave, I said to the family, I will hide someplace else. There was no place to hide, but a Nazi spotted me and he said, what are you doing here? I said, if I got my coat, where you going, you don't need a coat. You better start running to the place where all people are gathering. Oh, by the way, where are your parents? I said, I, they left already. So I came to this place where thousands and thousands were standing, and I'm below, and behold, I saw a scene which is indescribable. The first thing I saw, a woman holding a baby and breastfeeding, and a Nazi came with the mayonnaise and pursed through the baby and threw it like a football. I looked, I couldn't believe what my eyes see. Then I saw a little girl standing on the, by herself, lost the family. They just shoot her on the spot, and I couldn't believe my eyes what I see. Then I have seen a couple, elderly, dancing in the middle of this. And I couldn't understand what it is. Then I realized when they experienced this kind of scene, they went off their mind. Then in front, there was a Nazi, was dressed in yellow, 
outfit, and with his finger, he pointed right and left, which means for people to go to death or to life. And I noticed that all the younger children and the elderly are being pushed to the right, which is to death. Now, um, and for others who had a certificate, like a doctor, a nurse, a tailor, a cobbler, these kind of people, or were strong, they let live. But I was a little kid, very small in size, etc. cetera. I, I looked, I was so happy that my family is not around me, among here. And I said, how can I survive here? So I went over to a family that have a, a number of children and I asked them if you're gonna take me as your son. And they said, I'm sorry we have our own, which I don't blame them. And then I went over to a lady who was holding two girls. And I saw that she has a certificate that she is a nurse. And I went over to her and I said, kindly, will you take me as your son? I have nobody here. And she looked at me and she said, listen, if they're gonna let me live with two children, maybe they let me live with three. Hold on. I hold on to her dress and she pointed to the guy with a finger right and left that she has a certificate and he let her go to live. And I was saved by this lady that was a nurse. I never seen her in my life. I just asked her for her name and she told me her name is Miriam Rabinowitz and I uh, thanked her graciously and then I ran to the, to the house to open up the cave to see my parents and the family. When I ran there, I came near the home. I saw four people dead in front of their house. So I was thinking, that's my family. So I passed out and was lying there. Then my aunt knew the opening of the cave, which she survived. And she opened the cave and my mother asked, where is Fivale, which means that was my name. Where is Philip? And she said, I didn't know. So my mother went to look for me and she found me lying not, not far away from the home. When she woke me up, that was the first time in my life that I've never forget embracing mother and hugging her and kissing her. Two weeks later, when I looked out from the window, I saw the woman that saved my life passing by. And I said, oh, mama, take a look. This is the lady that took me as a son. She saved my life. Mother went out from the house and he, she thanked her and blessed her and she came crying back to the home. About two months later, there was the final destruction of all the Jews in the ghetto, which is called Juden Rain. Juden means Jews, Rain means clean. Juden Rain means the cleaning out of all the Jews. We went out again in the ghetto, and I mean in the uh, 
cave in the ghetto, of course, and we sat there for six days and six nights. Finally, we were discovered. When we were discovered, Mama said, boys, this is the last. Try to save yourself if you can. So the third boy in line started to run, and they, sh they shoot him right in the back. The second boy in line went in at the hot house, not on top, but on the bottom, and I went onto a bush where it was underneath where the ghetto begins. And the wire were underneath my hands where I was lying, and the German was standing guard there, pushed the wire, and the wire hit my hand. It was bleeding, and I didn't say boo. And then I heard what's going on. They took my mother and the two children, the two younger children, and the two younger boys, and the girl, my sister, and they took her away, I don't know where. But my father was not with us because he was working outside the ghetto. He couldn't get in and couldn't get out. So I went to look for father. And I knew where he worked. When I came there close by, a dog started to bark ferociously, and the Nazis heard this, and they spotted me, and they asked me, what is your name? And I told them, my name is Lazowski. Lazowski is not a Jewish name. So he took his hand, and he gave me such a slap that I fell down upside down. I was lying there, then he grabbed me by my neck and brought me to a movie house, which is called a kino in Russian. Kino means a movie house. Well, in the movie house, I found my mother and the two brothers and one sister. We embraced again, and he knew that the end is coming. We were on the second floor, and the windows were barked up with wood. It was dark inside. Only little light was going through the windows. And then the trucks are coming, which means the massacre begins. So mother took a chair and she hit the window open and she said to me, I want you to jump from the second floor. I said, Ma, I don't want to jump without you. I want to be with you. And she told me three things. I want you to survive. I want you to tell the world what's going on here and I want you to be somebody. And she pushed me out the window, and I fell in the grass, lying there. And about 50 feet away, there was a guard. He heard the jump when I landed on the floor. He made sure that he doesn't hear or turn around. He was looking the way they packed all the people into the trucks. Then lying there, another mother threw out another boy 
eight years old, and he fell next to me, and he was lying there. The trucks went away. I don't know where to go. So I went back to the ghetto. In the ghetto, I saw everybody rubbing whatever it's left over, the furniture and all this. I saw a, fa a fellow man, a farmer, struggling with a piece of furniture. So I asked him, can I help you? I spoke, of course, the Russian language. And uh, he said, by all means, help me. And I started a conversation with him. And I said, there's no more Jews here, right? Oh, he says, no more, finished. Are there any Jews alive? Oh, he says, there is about 30, 40 kilometers from here, there's a place named Dvoretz. Over there, there are 10,000 Jews now still working on the airfield. But as soon as they, they finish the airfield, they will be killed too. So where, where is this uh, Dvoretz? Oh, he said, not far away. I remember the name. And I said to the little boy, let's run. At that time, the corn was so high and we were so small. So we ran into the cornfield and we hid ourselves waiting for a couple hours. And then we started to look on the highway to Dvorets. The sun is about to be setting and I said to myself, during the night I wouldn't be able to see the road so well. Might as well stay over here next to, I saw a wooden place. And the boy was so tired, I had a little jacket, I put it on the floor, he lay down and fell asleep. I went around the whole night, what to do with myself, where shall I go? I didn't sleep a whole night. That was the longest night of my life. Then the sun is about to come to rise. I woke up the boy and I said, oh, by the way, he introduced me. I never seen the boy before. His name was Abe Goldstein. So I said, Abe, I woke him up. We gotta go. He says, he came out with me to the road, he says, I'm not going with you. I said, why aren't you going? He said, well, I don't have a father or mother, I don't wanna live. I said, mother threw you out just like me, my mother. She wants you to live like my mother did. But I don't wanna live without mother and father. I want to go back and get killed. So I hold him by his neck and hold him fast and strong, but he ripped away from me and he started running. He ran about a couple hundred feet and I kept on shouting, don't go, don't go. Then he turned around and he went back to me and to make the story short we went to Dvoretz on the way we were robbed but in Dvoretz as soon as we opened the barbed wire a cousin was standing there and he saw this little boy and he grabbed him and said oh my god you are alive come with us stay with us and I didn't see the boy since then. Then in Dvoretz, as an orphan, they put me in an orphan home. 16 kids, orphans that survived, were lying on the floor in one room. In the orphanage, I found my brother. So we engraved ourselves Right together, we told them that nobody's alive, etc. 
only maybe the father still alive. While we are employed to go to build this airfield, we spotted a Christian friend that came from Belitza, and he noticed us. And we told him, listen, if you find the Lazowski, maybe he's alive, tell him that two boys are still alive. And this Christian friend was so good that he found my father. And my father was quite ill in the woods, so he sent my uncle to come to Dvoritz, and they took us out from Dvoritz to the woods. In the woods, we lived two and a half years. Two and a half years in the woods to live, 85% of the people that entered the woods never survived. The reason to live in the woods, 50 below zero. People die of cold, that's the worst thing of dying. The body doesn't belong to you, only the mind works. I saw a person freezing to death, he said to me, do my favor, kill me. And the reason is because what the Germans did is as follows. When they found a partisan or a Jew in the year 1943, they would take him to a village, cut his part of the body, and put some salt on the body to show the people that's what we do to people. He didn't want to be dragged to a, a village and to cut his part of his body, even though the body didn't feel it. That is the stories that transpired during the woods. When we were liberated, we were liberated in 1944 from the Russians. And the Russians were not too good to us either. So we tried to get out from Russia. And then we heard a law passed. All the Polish citizens may go back to Poland. So that was our opportunity to go to leave Russia. Or now it's white Russia before it was Russia. You know, in those places, everything changes. In a few years, there is something else. It's, so um, we went back to Poland and we tried to get in to Palestine, to Israel. Unfortunately, the door to Israel was closed because the English people did not allow and the, whoever tried to get in to Israel were, were placed to Cyprus, another camp. Who wants to go to another camp? There were so many camps. So we, the family that we had in New York, my, fa my father had a brother and two sisters, found out that we are alive. And at the age of 17, I arrived in the United States. In the United States, not knowing the language and not having any money, I tried to support myself. I became a helper to a truck driver. What do we do? Three o'clock in the morning, we used to get up in New York. We lived in Brooklyn. We took the bus, I mean the subway to New York, and. Um, we loaded frozen eggs in a big can, which weighed about 80, 90 pounds, to deliver to the bakeries. And I worked there from 3 o'clock in the morning till 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Then I went 
to high school, Thomas Jefferson High School in Brooklyn. I graduated Brooklyn, uh, Thomas Jefferson in two years, and then I applied to Brooklyn College and uh, Yeshiva University. I was accepted to Brooklyn College, thank God, because I didn't have any money, but you have over a B average, you go for nothing. And the Yeshiva University was $16 a credit, but I didn't have $16. So I had to go to Brooklyn College at night and Yeshiva University in the morning, and, and that's where I studied there. Now, <clears throat> while studying in the Yeshiva University, we were invited, I was invited to a wedding. The custom is all the students invite the class. And I was, didn't want to go to the wedding, but what am I going to do at a wedding? I don't know how to dance, never danced. So, um, I was sitting at the table, and next to me was a lady that, she, that I didn't ask her to dance, so we started a conversation. And the conversation was, where you come from? And I told him, well, I come from a little town you wouldn't know. I mentioned the name, the word Belitza. She says, oh, my best friend saved a boy from Belitza, but they don't know where he is or where he's alive. So how did you save? And she tells me the story. And when she finished telling us the story, she says, I am the boy. Where did the family live? In Hartford, Connecticut. So I went downstairs and I asked the operator to get me to Rabinowitz's family. And she asked me how many Rabinowitz families are there? Oh, she says she's about five or six. Tell me which is the family. Everybody has the same name there. She says, pick the first one. She picked the right one. And the woman asked, answered the phone, and I introduced myself. I am the boy that you saved. And I came to see her. Well, to make the story short, um, uh, you remember she had two daughters, one was seven and one was five. I married one of them. <laughs> <clears throat> By the way, going to, I was very friendly with many Christian uh, priests and ministers. As a matter of fact, uh, talking about priest. Father Kiley, if you know him, worked with me for 40 years in the Institute of Living. And when the Hartford Hospital was honored me to name the chapel of the Hartford Hospital, I told him he deserves to be named as I do. I wouldn't want my name alone to be. And they named Father Kiley as well as me in the Hartford Hospital. Um, by the way, while I was going, I was friendly with the priests and ministers. I took every year trips to Israel, and every time I used to go to Israel, I used to leave the name of Abe Goldstein, the little boy, that I saved his neck. And uh, one of the, after 20 years or so, Somebody came over to me and says, Rabbi, guess what? We found your boy. He lives in Edmonton, Canada. When I came back to the United States from Israel, I called the boy, and uh, he answered the phone. He says, who's calling? And I said, the fellow who saved your neck. There was a silence for a minute. Then he said, oh my God, I do remember. He never told his family that he's a Holocaust survivor. By the way, 
This fellow has three children. All of them are doctors. And he owns 36 restaurants in Edmonton, Canada. <laughs> when I was retired, he came to tell the story how I saved his life with his wife. There are many stories to tell, especially how do we survive in the, in the woods, which one little story I'll tell you, which is amazing. A woman gave birth to a baby. What do we do with a baby in the woods? We have no way to clean the baby. The only thing what we used to use leaves to clean the baby instead of diapers, of course. No washing because there's no water. Well, one day the shooting started. The German came close by about two or three miles away. And the baby was crying terribly because she wanted to eat or drink. But we didn't have anything. So the mother took the hand and put it on her mouth and also on her nose. And holding the baby, the baby became blue. And when she became blue, she did not breathe. He did not breathe. That's a he. Well, the shooting came closer and closer, so we left the baby under a bush and we ran. At night we came to bury the baby. Guess what? The baby is alive. We swore to ourselves that whatever we're going to do, we're going to save the baby. The baby was saved and is now a lawyer in New York. <laughs> I can tell you stories for hours. I just want to tell you, they asked me to leave time for questions. So I spoke close to, uh, to an hour. They only gave me 40 minutes, but there was no charge. So. <laughs> So, are there any questions you'd like to ask? By all means. Yes. You know, we say time is a great healer. We have to understand we cannot hate people forever. A lot of people ask me the question, during these so many years that passed by, do you hate the Nazis, do you hate the Germans? And I tell them one th a little th anecdote, which I feel answers the question. You know, everybody is born with one soul. The soul that you have is precious. If God would give me another soul, I might consider hating other. But I have one soul. 
if I have one soul, I want it to enjoy life. Why should I hate people? I want to enjoy people being happy, being loved one another, being helped one another. The world was created for us to complete the world. The world is not complete unless we are doing something to make this world a better place. So times have changed. We change with the times. But what direction we go, that's very important. If we go loving one another, helping one another, caring one another, then we are doing a good deed. But we're going hating and killing and destroying and having terrible feelings about other people, that is wrong. So we have to do whatever possible can in this world to be a good human being. And to be a good human being means to share with others, to care with others, and live in peace with others. Otherwise, one will swallow them one another. And that's the problem that we're facing today. We are facing something which uh, I think we ought to uh, be very understanding that um, there is a reminder that we must have a little bit faith and courage to live in this world. Otherwise, this world would not exist. We have to do a little bit more caring and to watch who our leaders are, if the leaders lead us in the right direction. We are all created in the image of God. And now a little bit rabbinic, sorry, if I don't go. But the idea is we have to show kindness to other people. If we don't show kindness to other people, we're beginning to hate one another. And when we hate one another, we are lost because hate brings terrible things to the world and to humanity. Yes, sir. Yeah. The one thing on your mind was how to survive. In order to survive, you have to have water and food. Now, you see, when you live in a cave during the winter time, in order to have water, you have to have go out from your cave, take the snow and melt it. You melt the snow, you cannot do a fire during the day because the fire can show for the smoke for a, for a long way. So you have to do it at night. When you have, you see, the most people don't understand. When you cave, there is no heat. What keeps you heat is the heat from your fellow man that you light together, body heat. When you have the body heat, you, excuse me, you have a lot of lice. Lice brings typhus. 85% of the people died of typhus. And um, in order to have food, 
You can't go out only when it snows or the storm, because if you go out any time you want, they will spot you with the footsteps that you go. So you learn how to survive in the woods in you know, many ways that people have the ingenuity how to survive, otherwise you'll be dead. The Germans hired people to look for people who were walking around to find the caves. We knew it. Therefore, we didn't have any uh, guns to protect ourselves. We didn't have any shoes either. We used to wear rags. And when the rags were wet, we had frozen the feet. People don't realize how to survive in, in this kind of situation. So <laughs> describing many things, how to survive in the woods during the summertime is much easier. You keep on moving around. Winter, sometimes for three or four weeks, you can't get out. You have no food. You live on peas. And when you have no fruit, you'll be able to take out your teeth like, like you take out something because there is lack of vitamins, etc., etc., which I don't want to go in in this business. But that's the way it is. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Oh, yes, lady. I'm sorry. For the people who survived, <clears throat> well, for the people who survived, I think they should tell the story because each and every survivor has a different story to tell. You should tell that we should be vigilant for a peaceful world that we should remember that knowledge and power, you must be clever enough to understand what other people do, what other people think, what other people are planning to do. Then you will be able to survive. Otherwise, you cannot survive. You have to fight anti-Semitism. You have to fight people who are obnoxious to, to do certain things to you. You have to be on the alert. We went through hell. And when you go through hell, you learn a lot of things how to survive. There are certain times you cannot trust people. Take a look, the propaganda that the Nazis did, they convinced the whole German wor world, the whole German nation, to follow one guy with the propaganda that he had. Now, can you imagine what words can do? Words can be truthful, but words can lie. And there's a lot, lot of propaganda lying that took place that people fall for it. And that's what we must be aware. In order to live in this country, we must have the democracy to care for one another and to feel for one another and to share with one another then we'll have a peaceful world. Otherwise, 
God forbid, one can swallow one another for no reason. There's such a wonderful country. There's so much that you can thank God people can share with the hungry, with the food, and so on. But people don't. And that is the problem. The problem is how to survive and to live in peace. You know, you don't take all the money with you. People are crazy about amazing so many millions and so on. But we have to care about other people as well. So that is the message for a fellow that survived, that, uh, that we must have feeling for other people. And we must do everything possible to make the world a better place for everybody. <clears throat> Any other question? Yes, sir. I have a question. First of all, thank you for surviving. And thank you for... Don't thank me. Thank God. Yes, okay. <laughs> I always believe in God. There's, everybody has to believe in something, even though a non-believer believes in something. So we have to believe in something. And there's something, you have free choice. You see, the, the man was created with which means free choice. You can do good, you can do evil. It's up to you. You want to believe? You believe. You don't want to believe? Don't believe. That's a free world. But it's up to you to do something which you believe. If you don't believe in God, at least do something good. So what are you doing? I drove you here. Thanks. Well, I, I just want to tell you, thank you for driving. <laughs> well, thank you very much for listening. And I hope that the story that I told you is a story that not everybody can tell because that is true a true story that I survived, and each and every survivor has his own story. But my story is really painful to, if you think what a little boy 11 years goes through, and uh, especially to be an orphan, number one. Number two, people want to kill him. Everybody's against you. It's not just because you're often and you go and beg for food and all this. But when you're often and everybody wants to kill you, then it's very difficult to survive. There, you know, from our town, only three kids survived. Three kids from a town. The rest of them never survived because they killed all the kids who were going first to be killed. And that is a tragedy that to wipe out a whole community, a whole nation like this is very difficult to comprehend. And 
I want you to think about this. It's not such a simple story. The story uh, brings a lot of thoughts, and every thought means something important. So I want you to be happy to live in this country, which is a wonderful country to live in. Thank God that we care about one another, and we hope to continue to do so. Otherwise, it will be no good. So we pray that God will bring peace to all of us and live in this country in peace. Thank you so much for listening.